the foolishness. Yes, I said the foolishness of the rebalancing free lunch. And I'm actually going to add a corollary, the diversification free lunch. It's, oh my goodness. Yes, I'm just a guy with my dog and my t-shirt, which is on backwards, uh, just because I threw it on. I wake up at five o'clock, dark in my room. I don't turn the lights on so my better half can still sleep. And I just throw on my shirts. I haven't, I haven't took a shower yet. So I just threw a hat on, haven't been shaved. All right, so let's dive into this. I'm, uh, I'm stunned. I, I, <laughs> I, the level of vitriol I take because I challenge the orthodox is, uh, is mind numbing to me. Um, I, so I want to, uh, I'm, I'm debating this guy who's well known in our, in, in our business. And I just, I cannot believe that people just follow the orthodox just because that's what we have. And they can, you know, put some fancy equations in there and say, look, I, I, I can't, I mean, I do believe it. It's just, I get so frustrated by this. And because I'm going to prove to you that's just, it's dumb, man. It's easy to do. <laughs> just... All right. So we're going to go in this first but foremost. We're going to see investing is free lunch. Investment portfolio rebalancing. All right. We'll go in that here in just a second. Hold on a second. Move myself out of the way here. And then we got diversification, the only free lunch in investing. All right, let's uh, be advised, these aren't two of the same exact things. Rebalancing and diversification are two different things, but they kind of fall under the same idea of modern portfolio theory. And so here's, I don't know who this guy is. Um, oh my goodness, it's written by, it's been a news writer for the Associated Press. All right, so there we go. So at least they have three kids. All right, so good for him. But, uh, when you say diversification is the only is often called the only free lunch in investing, um, and you get it from an AP reporter, you know you should go the exact opposite. So let's keep going here. And there we have Markowitz. He said diversification is the only free lunch in investing. And what a Nobel Prize! Oh, and that's what gets all the uh, the wannabes in financial uh, realm. So he won a Nobel Prize. Robert Schiller won a Nobel Prize. Krugman won a Nobel Prize. Samuelson, I'm sure Samuelson won a Nobel Prize. Milton Freeman won a Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize. What's the guy's uh, Black Shoals? Um, I'm thinking about the guys who are long-term capital man. Let me get that book. Hold on a second. All right, so here's my man, Roger Lowenstein, The End of Wall Street. But he actually wrote this book, When Genius Failed, The Long-Term Capital uh, Management, The Nobel Prize, uh, Academics of LTCM. Oh, they're going to change the world. We've got models behaving badly. Uh, when confusing illusion with reality can lead to disaster on uh, Wall Street and, and uh, in real life. Obviously, reading this, uh, Nicholas, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, Taleb Taleb, uh, and then uh, Benoit Mandelbrot as well. There's tons of guys to read that t challenge this whole orthodox. Uh, it's all based on Harry Markowitz, and the reason it's based on Harry Markowitz, we're going to go into him. Like, I don't know antipathy towards this guy. I just think we've all been sold a bill of goods because he's the creator of modern portfolio theory. All right. And because he has that Nobel Prize after his name, it's like, we can't challenge Markowitz because they all say this. And these debate things I'm in, they all say Nobel Prize winner Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner Markowitz, Nobel Prize winner, who's the guy from uh, Black Shoals? Long term capital management. Uh, the heart of the fund was a group of brainy PhD certified Robert. Trajers, arbitragers, many of them had been professors and two had even won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so smart because they have the Nobel Prize. And I think it was Scholl. Let me just see who uh Iron Scholes won a Nobel Prize as well. So we can't discuss Nobel Prize. All right. So let's go to Mark Wiss because he got the Nobel. You're smart. I'm just a guy by t shirt. I even have it on right side out. Or right side in, whatever it's called. Anyway, so let's go to look at modern portfolio theories introduced in 1952. Huh. Huh, what was going on in 1952? Oh, all the soft sciences of business schools, economics, they all want to be a hard science. They had physics envy. All right, physics had chemistry envy, and they all had math envy. So we're going to throw a bunch of equations out there, fancy schmancy equations to show how smart we are, and everyone else can go pound sand because we are so smart. Uh, then William Sharp and M Merton Miller, they all, uh, they all won the N Nobel Prize in 1990. Specifically, they cited the theory of portfolio choice developed by Markowitz as the first pioneering contribu contribution to the field of financial economics. And that's where everything went to hell. Uh, this right here, then Samuelson in the 1960s, and we're all doomed for insanity in economics departments ever since. All right. 
Uh, let's see. Capital asset pricing model, a theory of price formation for financial assets developed by William Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Just the whole thing, man. Uh, let's keep going because I want to show you why it was one of the three. Uh, let's see. Uh, I want to show you what modern right here. So he's ran. He was working for the Rand Corporation. Look, like, you don't need to be. I'll, I'm just telling you that that. that I just ch I knew this. I just chuckled again how heavily involved Rand Corporation is, Rockefeller Foundation, the movement of our. Uh, previous society to a academic science-based society that Eisenhower warned us about. It's amazing to me, and Eisenhower is spot on. All right. Uh, in his lecture, he said, the basic concept of portfolio theory, blah, blah, blah. All right, I know that. Um, right here. The maximized expected, uh, let's see, I want to show you right here. If investor were only interested in expected values, he would be of interested in the, uh, he would be, uh, need only to invest in one single security, is what Mark was said. But he realized that investing in a single security was not the way investors did or should act. He knew that investors diversify because they're concerned with risk as well as returns. He also knew that while investors understood the benefits of diversification, they needed tools to determine the ideal level of diversification, the efficient frontier model, which led to MPT. MPT and diversification, the only free lunch in investing. It's, oh, look at this. I didn't even realize this, Paul says. <laughs> we are led by technocratic fools, man. There's no other way around that. Mathematical portfolio management, the whole thing is just a clown show. Criticisms of modern portfolio theory. Anyway, so I want to show you something here because we're just going to cut to the chase. Oh, I just got to show you this right here. Um, my, look at my man, Michael Edison. The, so we're going to combine portfolio theory and rebalancing in one fell swoop. We're just going to hammer it. And we're, oh, you know what we're going to do? Watch this, guys. We're going to take my my wife's dad's, oh, excuse me, Pablo, whatever this thing is called, some Irish thing right here. Any of you Irish people out there know what this is called. And we're going to smash modern portfolio theory and rebalancing as if it has any kind of free lunch associated with it. I'm not saying you shouldn't rebalance. I'm not saying you shouldn't have diversification. I'm just saying the idea, there's some science behind this as a free lunch. It's so freaking dumb. We're going to take this thing. Boom! Smash! We just smashed that. Oh, sorry, Finney. I just scared. Oh, Finney's looking at this like, oh, sorry, baby. I just scared him. But it's fun because I love taking on this stuff because it's so silly. Anyway, I'll let you read Edison's column. Um, perhaps the most universally accepted investing principle is to periodically rebalance one's portfolio. Advisors have been drilled that rebalancing results in some combination for improved performance and reduced risk. Unfortunately, the precept is the byproduct of imperfect mathematics. The benefits of rebalancing are far smaller than what advisors have come to believe. All right, and so... Uh, <laughs> Why does academic finance fills, fill its articles of mathematical sound and fury that signifies so little? What is wrong with the field of mathematical finance that can produce such inferior work, published peer reviews with so little relevance for anyone who wishes to know whether rebalancing provides the benefits? He will explore it. Edison, he's a mathematic whiz. I mean, he'll, you know, he just, he, he's, he just, he crushes. I love that guy. Um, all right. So anyway, I want to show you something here and just going to smash this once and for all. We're going to take the S&P 500, the total stock index, and we're going to combine it. So this is for diversification, just FYI. So the total stock, now, is the S&P, uh, the, uh, the total stock index diversified? Yes, it is. 100% it is. It is. 100%. But still, we're going to take the S, the total stock index combined with diversification. Remember, efficient frontier model assumes that you have international stocks, you add all these other stocks, you add all these other components to be diversified. And that diversification will give you less risk. Now, I am truly diversified in the uh, using the total stock index. I grant you, but it's all U.S. no bonds. All right, so we are moving our diversification lower and lower and lower in the total stock index because we have all U.S. stocks with no bonds. And the bulk, I think, seventy to seventy-five percent of the S of the um, total stock index is the S and P five hundred anyway. All right, so let's take a gander. We're going to compare these two from 2000 to 2023. That's 23 years of experience. <laughs> All right, so if, re if diversification gives us more return with less risk, I this would give us a sample of that, right? Now let's go into this. We're going to hit Analyze Portfolio, and we'll just see what it comes up with.
The only reason to go to 2000 is because we don't have enough. The total stock index doesn't go that far in the uh, the Vanguard Target Retirement Funds. That's what the v I'm using. The Vanguard Target Retirement Fund is uh, 2035. It won't matter which one we use, and it's going to be a lot more diversified. And what we're going to see is you'll see. Oops, I gotta get that guy over here. One second. There we go. Um, oh my goodness! Total stock index was up from 10,000 bucks to 50,000 dollars. Uh, the, the diversified portfolio, the target fund was only at 33,000 bucks, a significant, significant difference there. All right. So our average, uh, compounded annual growth rate was literally 230 basis points higher in the total stock index than it was a target fund. Our standard deviation was higher too. But remember standard deviation doesn't just mean downside risk. It also means upside, uh, uh, upside uh, uh, potential as well. So our best year was 33%. Our best year in the other phone was 28%. Oh, our worst year was 37. Our worst year was 34, we'll say 35. And our max drawdown was not down, 48% versus 51. So is that diversification, did that do you any good? Of course not, you still got smoked, still got smoked. I mean, it just, it didn't do you any good, man. Uh, it just is silly to even say that. I mean, so we can say, oh, but look, and of course, these are all rebalanced as well. All right, so we can obviously say, well, the total stock index is diversified. Okay, so let's do something else. Add the uh, Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund. All right, so let's take a look at VDIGX. Let's take a gander. So VDIGX, what we're going to see is we're going to see how many share, how many holdings it has. All right, we're going to come on down. The price is right. Come on down. You're on the price is right. Hold on a second. Let me see. Let me just pause it. It's got 40 stocks 40 40 stocks all large cap all domestic i think it's all domestic yeah, but it doesn't matter not very diversified <laughs> all with some kind of dividend growth behind it so nothing has any stocks that don't have a dividend i mean i could be wrong i highly suspect i'm not because that's the point about dividend growth to get dividend growth you have to have dividend paying stocks so we're getting rid of any stock that doesn't have a, a dividend to it all right, so we, so let's just, all right, now the, the guys will say, yeah, but we need math, math or what they say, the Nobel Prize say you know, 30 different stocks and that's diversified. Okay, so you see how so this is, so there comes a level of diversification to quantify that they'll say you're truly diversified, so I'm still falling under the diversification. It's, I mean, the whole thing's just dumb, though. I mean, when it comes to efficient frontier, just look at efficient frontier, man, I'm just telling you. So again, if diversification were the only free lunch, a truly free lunch, we should see um, the Vanguard dividend growth. Oh my lands is at sixty-one thousand dollars from ten thousand bucks in two thousand. So the last twenty-three years of experience, the Vanguard dividend growth didn't just double. Didn't I don't even know what six times is quintuple plus one. I don't know what that is. It, it more than it almost doubled the rate of return of the target fund, which again is diversified and rebalanced, by the way. <laughs> I mean, had 40 stocks in there, you know, maybe had 50 at some point, but I mean, <laughs> and, and even it smoked the uh, as the total stock index as well. All right, so let's look. What is worse here is only 25%. What is worse? Is max drawdown was only thirty eight percent. What is best year was higher? Is standard deviation is lower and its compounded annual growth rate is ten percent. What? How how can that be? <laughs> I mean, oh, it's tough to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I want to go to comp composition here, right here, exposures. All right, so let's take a gander, shall we? Here is the uh, target fund, large cap value, large cap uh, growth right there, 46%. Global U.S. developed markets, 18%. Nothing, nothing. Look, zeros across the board. They got some short-term treasuries that dividend growth does and some intermediate tre They got some treasuries, that's it. <laughs> they got treasuries. International, emerging markets, mid-cap growth. And then, of course, here's the, the total stock index. No bonds. A little bit of emerging markets. That's weird. But anyway, I mean, you see what's happening here, right? 
Ay, ay, ay. So there's no free lunch. Now, does that mean you put all your money in diverse, uh, dividend income or growing dividend fund? No, man, because you don't know what the, and this is the thing that drives me up the wall. You don't know what the future holds. Back to this guy who wrote, uh, there is such a thing as a free lunch. The beauty... <laughs> The real beauty of the diversification is that it produces long-term returns similar to individual risk categories while smoothing out volatility along the way. I like how they, they say it does X, Y, Z. It, you can't say that. You don't know that to be true. I just disproved that. I just disproved that. If you take the Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund and you take you look at the metrics, the compounded annual growth rate, the downside standard volatility and the max drawdown max drawdown was i mean we're talking 20 to 25 percent lower than that of the diversified rebalance portfolio the worst year was what was that eight nine <laughs> i mean it's it's a it's 900 basis points worse and yet it had a better higher year than vanguard uh, target retirement fund you just can't say X equals Y. You, you can't. we got to stop doing this. The beauty of diversification is that it produces. You can't say that. And you absolutely can't say it produced in the past tense because you it's not true. I just disproved that. And if we disproved it from the past tense, we certainly can't say it's proven in the future. That's silly. The muting of sharp up and downs is crucial. It helps protect you from the most dangerous obstacle you face as an investor, your own emotions. I hate that too, by the way. And I'm not trying to pick on these guys. It's just the first thing that came up. Oh, right here. <laughs> Diversification is often called the only free lunch in investing. That's because it costs virtually nothing to diversify, yet it yields great benefits. A reduction in portfolio volatility plus a degree of protection. Man, I just, you can't, you just, this is horrible, horrible. So, boom, debunked. Now, is that, again, what does that mean for you? You shouldn't listen to any of these guys, dudes. I'm telling you, they don't know what the other talk about anymore than I do. I don't know what the future holds. Hell's bells, dudes. You know what I'm saying? No one knows. I have my speculations, but I absolutely could be wrong. You could be wrong. But just because they have a Nobel Prize doesn't mean they're right. Just because they have some fancy schmancy good time rock roll mathematics doesn't mean they're right. The evidence doesn't is not overwhelming, if at all, even existing. And as such, you just say, okay, I'm just going to buy what I'm going to buy. I'm going to hold it and be done with it and look out the window. But you're not following the efficient frontier. You're not following modern portfolio theory. You're, portfolio theory. You're not following Kaplan, uh, capital asset pricing model. You're not following Black Shoals options. Yeah, because I, I have a brain. Love to hear your thoughts. Oh, that's going to make some people in this industry mad. Probably want to sign up for my email because at some point I'm sure I'll be banned for life because I'm a heretic. We'll see you.